Hello, I'm Eva, and I would like to welcome you to another episode of The Charm of It, a podcast for knitters who share my fascination with the nitty-gritty details of our craft. This is Thistle, my co-host, and Moth, my other co-host, has joined us. You just can't see her because of my lap. So I apologize for the delay between episodes. I have chronic health conditions, in case you're a new viewer, and lately they've just been very demanding uh, and you know there's other stuff that I have to do so especially since in winter there aren't as many hours of daylight it has just become quite difficult to record but hopefully I will get back on a more regular schedule soon this is going to be a normal episode but I'm also going to talk about works in progress just because it's been so long since I recorded so you're going to hear about works in progress finished objects I'm going to answer a viewer question and talk a little bit about ambidextrous knitting. Oh, and do a yarn review. So, thanks so much if you're a returning viewer for sticking with me. I really enjoy getting to see you again. And if you're a new viewer, thanks for giving me a go. Let's see. Oh, the one other administrative thing is that I am trying a different lens today in the hopes of dealing with the focusing issues because I definitely don't want to give anyone vertigo while they watch my podcast. So please let me know if this setup works better for you if you are prone to any kind of problems, um, you know, vertigo kind of problems or anything else. Uh, and let's get started. So my first finished object is a gift knit and it's this little lamb which I embroidered with a sleeping face. And as you can see, whenever I work with black yarn, I never do it quite tight enough, so then the stuffing shows through, but I don't mind. I think she's really cute. So this is for one of my friends is expecting a baby in April. And it's going to be a baby girl, so I'm really excited. I want to knit her a little dress. But I'm going to knit the dress out of cotton yarn because my friend lives in South Texas and when it's cold out I prefer knitting with wool so I didn't want to start a big cotton project. But I wanted to have something to send her before her due date. So I went ahead and knit this up and I'm going to send it with a little board book that I got. And this is using the Free Barber Prime pattern. And the only change I made was doing embroidered eyes instead of safety eyes because it's going to be for a newborn. The gray yarn is Barocco Remix, which is, it's kind of a kitchen sink yarn. It's all these different recycled textile fibers, so um, it doesn't have wool in it, but it's got nylon, silk, cotton, acrylic. I'm not really sure what else, but it's machine washable and dryable, which is what's important. And I thought the Tweety look would look nice, and it came from my leftover stash, so win, win, win. This was really fun to knit up. Most of Barbara Prime's patterns are knit flat and then seamed, and so that's what I did with this one. And I like how the directions for the way you attach the limbs make it so that her little legs and arms can move around. I tried Portuguese knitting for this lamb, which is why the project is called Cordeira. I'm sure I pronounced that wrong, I'm sorry. I even Googled it to see, but I don't know, for some reason, apparently it didn't stick in my head, which is Portuguese for lamb. Thistle, come here, sweetheart. I apologize, I don't know why my pets have decided that sitting down to record is a signal to play instead of to nap in my lap. Thistle's back on my lap. Hopefully that means she will leave her squeaky toys alone for the next 45 minutes or so. As I was saying, I have really wanted to try Portuguese knitting for a while because, as I will talk about later, really enjoy being able to knit both continental and English style or picking and throwing, you know, whatever, multiple words. So I thought it would be nice to add a third style to my repertoire. And what I did for trying it was instead of stranding the yarn behind my back or behind the back of my neck because I have neck issues, so I didn't like the idea of that, I used one of those removable safety the coilless safety pins, also called removable stitch markers. Um, I have a bunch of those because I use them in my knitting. And so I just clipped one to my shirt and then I threaded the yarn through it. So that way I could try out Portuguese knitting with a pin without having to buy the special little hook pin. And I was really excited and I enjoyed it quite a bit. I knit the body with it and both legs. But then I started getting a lot of pain right here, my left collarbone. 
And so I stopped knitting for a couple days, and when I started knitting one of the arms, I realized it was the Portuguese-style knitting that was irritating my collarbone, not my normal continental style, which I thought must have been the problem. Sorry, Moth has apparently gone insane. Anyway, and so within a few stitches, it had gotten so bad that I couldn't do any more. So I switched to English style for the arms, the head, and I think I did one ear Portuguese and one ear English. But luckily the tension matches pretty well. So I'm pretty disappointed about that. I was hoping that Portuguese style would be something where I would knit tighter without having to uh, stress my hands out. That's why I'm a looser knitter in general is because I find it uh, much more comfortable to do it that way. But I don't know, something about the way you flick your thumb up just irritated my collarbone. So I'll be looking up some videos to see if there are different ergonomic ways to do Portuguese knitting, but it will probably not become a major part of my repertoire. It was fun to give it a try, and I have a cute little lamb to show for it. The other finished objects that I have are no longer with me because they were also gifts. I've been doing a lot of gift knitting in heavier weight yarn, which is my favorite kind of gift knitting because <laughs> it doesn't take as long. <laughs> So both my sister and my niece have their birthdays in early February. You saw most of my niece's hat on my last episode. And so I finished that and sent it off. And for my sister, I will insert photos. I made her a cowl and matching slippers. And this was out of Madeline Tosh Vintage DK. It was my first time using Madeline Tosh. And I got to use it because the, I used two skeins and they were a generous gift. So thank you very much. It was really nice being able to use that yarn for my sister because she's very sensitive to wool. So the fact that it's super wash merino meant that I didn't have to worry at all. Um, so, yeah. And it was, well, you'll see the pictures, but it's a pale gray with a bunch of different speckles, kind of rainbow speckles. And she really loves her finished gifts, so that's exciting. The, the cowl is the star shower cowl. which is written for fingering weight yarn and I really didn't have to make many changes for it to work in DK. All I did was I joined it a little sooner. As soon as I got in the pattern she says what length it should be when you're joining. So once I got to that length I joined and then I only knit five sections instead of six sections because it was long enough. And I did the star shower cowl because I sent my sister a few photos of different cowl patterns from Ravelry and she really liked the shape of the star shower. So. Yeah, I, as I've said before, I tend to not be a surprise gift knitter. For something like a baby, that's fine. But because for me, part of the fun is customizing my knitting to be exactly what I want it to be. So I figure my gift recipients will also enjoy that. And then I had enough leftover yarn that I could make her some slippers when I was... When I was home for Christmas, she was saying that her feet are always cold. And so I know that the simple house slippers pattern is quite popular, but I don't know. The looks of it just didn't quite appeal to me. So instead, I went with a, a fairly similar pattern from Church Mouse Yarns. I cannot remember the name of the pattern. I'm sorry. But uh, it'll be linked on my project page. It was a free pattern. And you knit it flat and then seam it. And I think the main difference is the garter stitch goes on a little longer, and then there's a pom-pom. <laughs> so apparently pom-poms are going to win me over. And I knit the smallest size for that because my sister has quite small feet. They're somewhere around a US 6. Um, so I just added a little bit of length, but I kept the width suggested in the small size. And for the body of the slipper, I held the yarn double because the pattern calls for doubled worsted weight, but the double DK was fine. I got gauge with it and stuff. And then the only modification I made was there's an optional cuff in the pattern, and I knit basically half of that cuff. It's supposed to be a fold over cuff. And then, so when you fold the slip, slipper and seam it, you're seaming it right up the center. And so I went ahead and seamed the cuff as well, because it goes down quite low on your foot. And that didn't seem like it would be quite warm enough. 
So I did the cuff and seam the cuff so that it goes up a lot higher on her foot. And then I put the big pom-pom right here. For the cuff, I was a little worried about yardage, especially since I wanted to do pom-poms. So I held the yarn single instead of double since, you know, it's not going to need to be as sturdy. And that worked really well. I used up every inch of my two skeins of yarn between the two projects, and I managed to get the green size pom pom, the Clover Maker pom poms, which this is one of my first times using those makers, which were also a gift because I mentioned on Instagram that my homemade pom poms were not the most efficient. And I love it. Oh my gosh, it used up all the yarn. You barely had to trim it to get a nice fluffy pom pom. And I would definitely. Like, I'm always skeptical of tools and gadgets, uh, but if you do pom-poms frequently, then I think that that is definitely something that's very useful. So let's talk about works in progress now. I've got two, well, technically three, but I'm actively working on two of them. I found that I really enjoy working on two, maybe three projects at once. Last year I had started working on more like a minimum of three and a maximum of five and uh, that was fine it was nice being able to rotate but I find that being able to rotate between just two is even nicer so I'll probably be doing more of that type of knitting I'm not sure how that will affect podcasting because it's easier to alternate between bigger episodes and then shorter episodes just about works in progress when you have more works in progress on the needles so We'll see how that works out, but the one that is probably, I should put it back in hibernation, but is I have cast on for the front of my Miss Limone jumper, which is my lace weight jumper, and as you can see, I've done about three rows of the cast on. I've been waiting on this one because the ribbing is on triple zeros, and it's with lace weight yarn. And the, of course, I could not just do regular 2x2 two two ribbing, I wanted to do a mini cable on the ribbing. So, it's quite fiddly, and since I've been experiencing some more pain issues, I just haven't wanted to aggravate my neck and shoulders and collarbone and what have you by working on this. But, um, hopefully I'll be able to pick it up soon, I'm hoping to be able to wear it in spring. Now, this is the only piece I have left, so... We'll see how long it takes me. <laughs> and then my other current work in prog, well, not my other, I've got two others, but one of my other works in progress are Matryoshki mittens. I'm really excited about these. And Matryoshki are the Russian nesting dolls. This is a free pattern on Ravelry. It's not in English. I think it might be in Finnish. I'm not sure. Either it's Scandinavian or Baltic. Um, I didn't double check, sorry. But it's charted, so it doesn't really matter whether you speak that language or not because you can just follow the chart and it's a really nice chart. And so I was going to make these for Claire of New Hampshire Knit. She does a, a mitten knit along. And the mitten knit along was supposed to start on February 15th, which is a Wednesday. And the Sunday before I sat down to swatch, and somehow I ended up with almost an entire mitten. So <laughs> these won't count for the knit along, but I'll still have new mittens to wear, so I don't mind. And here's what it looks like on. The only thing that I haven't done on this, I've even woven in all the ends. That I really like that pinstripe palm. It was really simple to do, and I think it looks quite smart. Is I'm going to make them convertible. I put this in way too low when I... I knit these, I'm knitting these on 9 inch circulars instead of DPNs, and it's a lot harder to try a mitten on with 9 inch circulars, and then it's got the afterthought thumb too, so I was trying to guesstimate how much space I needed, and I just estimated wrong, so usually I would put that waist yarn in up here where my fingers start. So on the second mitten, I'll just do it higher, and I just won't care if the palms don't quite match, but yeah, so, and I did change the cuff. So the cuff for the pattern has some garter stitch and then some more of the pin striping and then more garter stitch, but I prefer a short cuff on my mittens and I want it to be quite slim and that's because I want it to fit easily under my winter coats. A couple of my winter coats have pretty slim sleeves so that can be an issue sometimes. 
So I did a provisional cast on and I knit the chart up so that I could see the length. And then once I had done the thumb so that I could try it on and see, and the length is really good. That's where my finger ends and that's where the mitten is. Anyway, so once I finished that, I went back and I did the cuff. Normally I probably would have used some of the dark gray for the cuff as well, but this blue color is Brooklyn Tweed Loft, their worsted weight yarn in faded quilt. And I really want to see what my skin thinks about their yarn. And so I went ahead and did the cuff in just faded quilt so that I could see what that feels like when I'm wearing it under coats. Although honestly, it'll probably be over sleeve. So for the cuff, all I did was some one by one ribbing to kind of echo the pinstripe. And then I tried out a new to me bind off from a book that I will be reviewing soon. I heard about it on Ellie's podcast, Croft, Croft, Craft House Magic. Yeah. But it's a crochet chain bind off and it was really fun and I like how it adds just a little bit of frilliness. It was really easy and fast too. I already know how to crochet even though I don't do very much anymore. But all you have to know how to do are chains and singles. So yeah, I think that that added a nice little touch that went well with the little Matryoshka. So that's the first one. And the second one. Oh, two balls of yarn. This is how far I am. So I'm just about to start her head right about there. And as you can see, I did not do a provision. Actually, I did still do a provisional cast on. What I did this time was I did the provisional cast on. I did the ribbing and everything. And then I went back and did the crochet chain bind off because I wasn't sure how to convert it into a cast on. And of course, they had to match. Whoops. So... As I mentioned, the blue color is Brooklyn Tweed Loft in Faded Quilt. This is my first time ever using Brooklyn Tweed. I got this skein from another Ravelry member who was de-stashing, and it was only $8. So since I've been wanting blue mittens, I thought this would be a really good chance to try out their yarn, which is, I believe, 100% Targi. So it's a breed-specific woolen spun yarn that's entirely made in the US. And what I really love is how heathered the colors are. And so I've admired it from a distance for a while. At retail price, it is very expensive for my personal yarn budget. Um, but the nice thing about woolen spun yarn is it tends, I tend to knit it at a looser gauge than I would the worsted spun equivalent. And so I don't need as much yardage to knit the same size project. So we'll see. I just wanted to try it out and see what happened. The contrast yarn is another woolen spun yarn. This is Owl from Quince & Company, which is 50% alpaca, 50% wool. And unlike most alpaca like this, which is worsted spun, this one is woolen spun. And this is not a colorway that Quince & Company sells. I over dyed this. It started out as Owl Tweet in oak, which is a really beautiful warm brown color with lots of flecks in it, kind of speckles almost of different shades of brown. And I got knit to knit some projects for my father and I had pretty much a whole skein left over. And my dad looks really great in warm colors, but my palette is on the cooler side. And so I decided that rather than buy some yarn to do as the contrast, I should just over dye this. And I was aiming for a navy blue since it was already a fairly dark brown. So I started with some Wilton's icing dye in sky blue, which is um, more of an aqua than a blue, really. And so that got me a deep teal. And so then I started adding some Kool-Aid grape <laughs> to get it less green. And that I was slowly getting it less teal, but then I got impatient and ended up dumping the rest of the packet in. And so that was too much. And I ended up with charcoal gray. But I think it looks just as good. So I don't mind that it's charcoal gray instead of navy. The only other thing I would say about these mittens is that this is worsted weight yarn, and I'm knitting it on size twos, which is my only nine inch circular needle. Um, it was a gift, so thank you. Anyway. The reason why I went down to twos is because, oh, next time I'll grab one of my mittens that I've knit out of worsted weight on fours. I'm a loose knitter, and I'm a loose knitter even in color work. I don't tighten up that much. 
So, uh, I started knitting these on a size 4, and I got up to about here on the chart, and it just didn't look that great. The, the design wasn't coming through the best, and it was quite large. And while I don't mind having larger colorwork mittens, I thought it would be nice to have a slimmer pair as well. So I decided to go down two needle sizes to a two, and then I remembered that I had that nine inch circular needle, which usually I, I love using double pointed needles for small diameter knitting. They're my favorite way to do that. And so I almost never use the nine inch circulars instead, but for color work, it's really nice to not have to worry about any joins because then you don't have to worry so much about tensioning your floats. So since I had the two, I went ahead and knit it on that, and it went really quickly. It took a while for my hands to get used to using those 9-inch circulars again, but now it's just very relaxing and fun to just go around and around. And I have not blocked this yet, but here are my floats on the palm side. And then here it is on the pattern side. So you can see this is definitely a pattern where you end up having to catch your floats. And there's one spot where I didn't catch my float, even though I probably should have. Right there. But other than that, I catch my floats if they're going longer than, I don't know, five or six. Six, I think, was what I did on this. So even five, I wouldn't catch the float. But six, I would definitely catch it, except for this one right here. And I think that makes a fairly neat interior. I noticed that I tighten up when I'm knitting on 9 inch circulars versus DPNs, um, which in this case was really handy, so I'm not going to complain. But that was just an interesting thing for me to note. I'm not sure why, maybe because I have to tension, you know, hold it a little differently. But it's really interesting because the fabric, I, I know that I'm getting less than, or sorry, more than six stitches to the inch in a worse weight fabric or worse weight yarn, and so the fabric, it feels more like thick wool felt as opposed to like typical knitwear, and so I'm really impressed with that. I think the mittens will be really nice and water and windproof, so I can see why people go way down for gauge when they're knitting mittens. My final work in progress is a cardigan, and it is my sugar plum cardigan. Let me take a drink of tea, because... I'm the only one podcasting, so I talk a lot. <laughs> okay. I'm pretty sure that I haven't recorded an episode since I started this. With, but if you follow me on Instagram, you'll have been following along. So I'm using Quinson Company Turn, which is their fingering weight wool silk blend. And I used it to knit a cardigan about a year and a half ago, and it's my one of my favorite cardigans. I really love it, so I was really excited to knit another sweater out of turn. And this is Dusk, which is this really beautiful purple mauve colorway, so that's why it's called my Sugar Plum Cardigan. And I received five skeins of this as a Christmas gift, and originally I was going to do an Alice Starmore sweater from Tudor Roses, which my library has, Jane Seymour, so it's the one with a bunch of crosses basically or sorry diamonds like lattice lattice work and I was really inspired by an anemone seashell that I used to have on my case until I knocked it off and it broke but um, so I got this and then I got four skeins of Quince and Company Finch which is their fingering weight 100% wool yarn in Damson I knew it was some kind of plum which is a darker purple color so I was going to do it in two shades of purple and then use a lighter color. You wrap the yarn later around these little cables. But then when I looked at the pattern, first I thought it was really weird that the pattern called for that much yarn because I can knit a sweater for myself out of five skeins of a fingering weight yarn, 250 grams. Um, so the fact that this called for almost double was kind of weird to me. And then when I looked, the gauge is really tight. It's, I can't even remember, it's at least 32 stitches per inch, maybe more. And the first cardigan I knit out of turn, I knitted six stitches to the inch in stockinette, and then the twisted stitch part was nine stitches to the inch. And I, But I like that 
kind of the looser fabric. And so I didn't really want to have this super tight because the Quince yarns are also plumper than the Alice Starmore yarns, which now I have. I didn't have when I had gotten this for Christmas. So I can understand why the Alice Starmore yarns might knit at that gauge differently than the Quince yarns would. Anyway, and so I decided that that was just not the best use of the project. I wasn't looking forward to it. I was a little nervous about it. And since I had five skeins of this, I might as well just knit a cardigan out of this. So I was thinking about it, and... Quince Turn is a nice, plump, tightly spun yarn, so it's really bouncy, and I thought it would be really good for some kind of texture work. And I love Guernsey sweaters, which are the ones with a bunch of knit pearl designs. One of the first jumpers I designed for myself was inspired by those, but I knit it out of a naturally heathered woolen spun yarn, and so you can't see all of the yoke designs as much as you would in a yarn like this. So. I decided to knit myself a Guernsey cardigan. I got some books from the library, and originally I had envisioned doing horizontal motifs like this, alternating all the way up the body in like rows, kind of like texture stripes. So that's what my first swatch was, and it was just, it was a mess. Did not look good. It was just not good. So at that point I was a little frustrated. <laughs> But I decided to rethink it, and the one thing I liked from that first swatch are these lovely seed stitch diamonds. Um, yeah, it's a little darker than it's showing up there, but I really loved those. And then I noticed when I was reading the book that a lot of the sample sweaters had little cables, and I always love cables. So instead of doing an all-over Guernsey pattern, I decided to just do a Guernsey yoke again. And for the body, instead of doing plain stockinette, I am using the stitch pattern from Hermione's Everyday Socks, which is a free sock pattern that's very popular on Ravelry. And I have had in my favorites forever a pair of socks that a knitter knit using that pattern out of this yarn. So that seemed like something that could work for me. And finally, I am using Mistake Ribbing for the bands because I just wanted to kind of carry through the seed stitch motif. And mistake ribbing is basically, it's two by two ribbing knit on a multiple of four minus one. And so what you end up getting is one column that's always knit, one column that's always purl, and in between them are columns of seed stitch. So I thought it was really a nice, I hadn't tried it before, but I really liked that texture. And so that's how I ended up with this swatch. And as you can see, I did two rows of reverse stockinette to divide the yoke from the body. And once I had that swatch done, I really liked it. And so I decided to cast on. Like I know that I mirrored them. So both front pieces and back piece. And you might notice that there is no mistake ribbing on here. That's because even though I really loved the ribbing, I wasn't sure how much negative ease I should knit into it because I really like how it looks relaxed. I don't like it so much when it gets stretched out. But I'm knitting a cropped cardigan that's going to be quite fitted at the waist and then get larger, kind of a vintage style cardigan because those are very easy for me to style in my wardrobe. And so I need to have a certain amount of negative ease at the waist to make sure that that stays nice and tight. So I decided that I wanted to knit that part last so that if I end up needing to redo it, it'll be really easy to just rip back and knit it on a different stitch count or smaller needles as opposed to having to, you know, cut along this and unravel that way. So that's why I started with a provisional cast on. The provisional cast on I use is from the Tech Knitting blog, and it's the cast on she describes at the beginning of her tubular cast on tutorial. And if you just do the cast on and don't do the tubular part, it makes a really great provisional cast on. It's really easy to pick up the stitches from the waist yarn, well, to just pull the waist yarn out, and the cast on goes so fast. Before this, I used to use the crochet provisional cast on where you pick up a stitch into the back of a crochet chain and that took a while so I would have to really think whether I wanted to do a provisional cast on or not 
but as you can probably tell from the fact that I've been using it so much, this one, it's so fast that it's really easy to do. Um, so yeah, just a heads up for that. And I had, so with the yoke, I decided I wanted to do mirrored cables. So they're facing the center. And they're pointing towards the center. You can see it better on the back. But um, there you go, towards the back. And then with the back, I didn't work out all the stitch counts before I started because I was impatient to cast on. So I worked out what I needed to do what I needed to start with and what I needed to increase to, so you know, waist up to the bust. And then once I got up here, I worked out how to place my diamonds and the cables and still, you know, have everything fit. And it worked out really well. What I did was I started the armhole shaping and I kept this in the regular Hermione's everyday stitch pattern because that's really easy. It just needs a bolt to pull for. And then as soon as I was done with the armhole decreases, that's when I started doing these patterns. And then I decided to bind off all at once for the neck. I actually, this is the second yoke I did. The first one I bound off in stages for a crew neck. And I just didn't like how you got that thing of stockinette. And I've noticed that even if you bind off all at once, if you knit the neckband without a corner, it makes a curved neckband anyway. So I'll still have a nice round neckband. I know this looks really low, but once I add the neckband in, it'll probably come to right about here. That's the goal anyway. And I want this to be a kind of comfy cardigan, so I made the armhole a little bit deeper than my Friny cardigan is, but I'm using the same numbers from that custom fit pattern because I really liked how that armhole and um, sleeve cap fit me. So I just am making it a little longer, but other than that, following those directions for those numbers. For the back, once I figured out the numbers, I realized that rather than have an extra diamond, which is what I would have ideally wanted, but the math just wasn't going to let me do that, I was going to have an extra cable instead. And so then I had to figure out what, which direction the cable should go in because it was in the center. And first I thought I would just do a left cross followed by a right cross, and that would make a braid. No, that doesn't make a braid. That makes like a swirly thing. And I didn't like that, so then I looked up on the internet and discovered, because these are 2x2 two two cables, so they need 4 stitches. If you want to make a braid, you have to have a multiple of 3, so you need at least 6 stitches. So I was about here, and I had to rip back because I wanted 6 stitches for a braid. And so then I tried, a, this is like the fourth version, basically, of this. So I tried a braid where I was crossing the cables less frequently and the braid didn't look very braid-like. And rather than rip back for that, I just dropped down. And then I re-knit it doing a cross every second row instead of every fourth row, like these are crossed. But instead of having them crossing towards the center, I had them crossing out of the center. Does that make sense? So like the braid looked like it was going in the other direction. And that would have looked nice on its own, but because both of these are pointing towards the center, it looked weird. And so I got to about here before I realized that I really didn't like that. So I dropped down again and <laughs> redid the cable so that it was pointing towards the middle. And then I was really happy with how that cable braid looked. And I've blocked this. And as you can see, the cable part where I dropped down to fix versus the part that I knit as established, there's really not that big a difference. The other thing I learned from knitting this, so the Hermione's Everyday Sock pattern, and it's a free pattern. The pattern action happens every second row, basically. And so there's always a rest row. And I thought, oh, well, I'll make the rest row my knit row, and then I'll do the action on the purl row, because it's just purl knit stitches. I did that for the fronts, and it was terrible, because uh, since I was increasing on the sides, I had to be incorporating the new stitches into the stitch pattern. And when you're doing it from the back, you cannot read your knitting nearly as well. Like from the front, those pearl bumps are super obvious. From the back, not so much. And so I had a few rows where I got almost through the row and realized that 
my pearls weren't lining up and having to go back and fix it. So I knew that when I got to the back, I just knit that so that the the action rows basically are happening on the right side and the pearl rows are the rest rows and that was way better. <laughs> so just something that I thought was funny um, as far as lessons learned. There is a reason why it's easier to do action stuff on the knit row and that's because it's easier to read your knitting. And then I've got, this is what I've got of the sleeves. Oh, that's my swatch. Hang on. Here we go. Okay. I wasn't sure at first whether I was going to do the sleeves in plain stockinette or in the Hermione stitch pattern. So I put it to a vote on Instagram and everyone voted for the stitch pattern. So that's what I did. And even though I'm knitting the body flat, I'm knitting the sleeves in the round until I get to the sleeve cap. Just because that's my preferred way to both knit and really wear. I prefer sleeves that don't have um, a sewn seam on them. And so because of that, I'm using different needles. And rather than do a gauge swatch, all I did was assume that I would have about the right size, about the similar gauge, and go ahead and knit up into what I thought would be my total stitch count for the sleeve. And then conveniently, that's when I ran out of the yarn, that skein. So I stopped and I started blocking this sleeve while I cast on for the other one because I figured any changes I would make would be quite simple. And the, I stopped and blocked it just to see what my uh, stitch and row gauge would be once you know I've worn it and stuff. So that's why I have two partial sleeves. And I really like how this sleeve is knitting up. As I said, I want it to be a more comfortable cardigan. So as you can see, this was really easy for me to layer over a slim sleeve underneath. But it also doesn't look super loose, you know. And so, yeah, I'm definitely looking at putting more positive ease into my sweater sleeves than I ever used to. And I already did the mistake stitch ribbing on here because it's not going to have all the negative ease that the waistband did. So I didn't have to worry about that kind of stuff. And I did not go down a needle size for this. I just left it at the regular needle size because the sweaters that I've knit in the past, I've done quite tight cuffs. I have quite small wrists. But then you try to push the sleeve up. And because that cuff is so snug, it, it can be tricky. Whereas with this one, I can easily push it up and there are no problems. The fun thing about mistake stitch ribbing is it's reversible. So if I want to, I can roll the cuff up instead. And it looks the same. I don't know if you can see that. But yeah, so just a fun bonus. And here you can see how I'm handling the increases on the sleeve increasing in pattern. I've got a two stitch, not seam, but faux seam. So I'm increasing on either side of those two stitches, which are always in stockinette. And then when I have enough, I just make them part of the pattern. So it ends up making this nice V that I find quite pleasant to knit with. So I've got 40 rounds left before starting the sleeve cap on this one. So I'm definitely getting towards a finished sweater and I'm really excited to be able to wear this. It's been really fun since I haven't been knitting as many socks. I love sleeve knitting because it's pretty much like knitting a pair of socks. Um, so I have been really enjoying this. Just so that you can see why blocking makes a difference. You know, the blocked versus unblocked fabric. It's a gauge didn't change much. It only gained about a quarter inch along this entire length. Um, but the drape and how the fabric looks changed quite a bit. Like this one looks a bit busy to my eye, whereas this one looks good. Those are all of my works in progress and I've already been talking up a storm. So I'm going to jump right to the yarn review. And I thought I would review Blue Moon Fiber Arts BFL Fingering, or no, BFL Sport, I apologize. BFL stands for Blue Face Luster, which is a breed of sheep. And this is a woolen spun yarn that I knit into a sweater, so you'll be able to see the wear. I can see I'm losing the light, so 
Let's see how much longer this episode goes. Okay. So, I knit this at a much looser gauge than they recommend, the yarn. And there's how the shoulders have worn for people who wear purses. I use a purse or bag when I'm out or a backpack. Here's how the underarms have worn. And these are very fitted underarms, so they're right up in there. <laughs> and here's how the bottom hem has worn, which gets quite a bit of wear because, of course, you sit on it. Okay, so I am really, really pleased with how this is worn, and I thought I would show you because I noticed there was a spot where when I was knitting I split the plies and I didn't realize it. Should have marked it with a pin. Now I'm not going to be able to find it. Let's see if I hold it up to the light. Okay, there it is. Yeah. Right here. I had split the plies and I was knitting, so that's just one lonely ply and it has not broken yet. I'll be reinforcing that now that I've noticed it. But So I'm very impressed with the strength of this yarn. Blue Face Lester is a long wool breed, and so they are better at wearing. But considering that I knit this at a looser gauge than suggested, and I've worn it, I wore it a lot last winter, which is when I knit it. I hadn't worn it as much this winter until I started moisturizing more. And then I could wear it again without any scratchiness. So now I've been wearing it a lot again. Oh, and here are the cuffs. The cuffs have shown more wear because originally this bottom part of the cuff was folded in. And so it was rubbing against my arms. And then I just modified that in December because it turns out I don't like having double the fabric in my cuffs. So that is how the yarn has worn. Very impressed with it. It's a wool and spun yarn, and so you don't get a massive amount of definition with the um, knit pearl panels up here, but I think you get enough. And then I love how it looks in the cables. And here's how it looks in seed stitch. And then it looks really pretty in stockinette as well. So I would definitely knit with this yarn again. I think it is, um, and since it's, I think it's a two-ply. Anyway, I think it would look really good in lace patterns as well. And um, what was I going to say? So it's from Blue Moon Fiber Arts, which is a U.S.-based independent dyeing company, but it's one of the big ones, so it's not as expensive as a lot of the Etsy sellers, just because of scale. However, they do sell in big skeins, so depending on how much yardage you need, that might or might not be to your advantage. But I believe it's sold in eight ounce skeins, which are right around 800 yards for $40, somewhere around there. And they offer lots and lots of colors. I got mine on D stash, so that's why I am not positive what it was. But as far as the prickle factor goes, because it's a woolen spun yarn, it is going to be more prickly than a worsted spun yarn would be. And BFL is the softest of the long wools, but it is not as soft as Merino. So I would say if you're a normal, average wool sensitive person, this is fine. I wore this against my skin all of last winter without any problems. But if you are sensitive to wool, you're going to need a layer between this and you. And let's see. I really like knitting with breed specific yarn. I think it's really interesting how the different wools behave. Because this is a long wool, it has really nice drape. So it would be really nice for cowls, that kind of thing. I used some of my leftovers to knit a hat and I held those leftovers double. And it's a really nice warm hat. I think the tonal color is absolutely beautiful. Um, I've become quite a fan of the Blue Moon Fiber Arts. I the cowl that I recently finished was also from them, and I'm about to start a sweater with them as well. So when you want a bit of a splurge in hand-dyed yarn, but still in the realm of affordable, with a lot of really interesting bases, if you live in the U.S., of course.
I would definitely encourage you to try them out. Finally, as the light is disappearing quickly, the sky was really bright blue when I started, but now it's overcast and we're getting closer to sunset. So I just quickly wanted to answer a viewer question about how I change the numbers. So if I'm using a sweater pattern and I've decided I prefer my gauge to the called for gauge, how do I plug my numbers in, basically? And I have recently started listening to the Knitmore Girls. I know that they're really famous, so you've already heard of them. I'm not sure why it took me so long to listen to them. And the way that Jasmine plugs in numbers is more efficient than the way that I used to. So now I use her method. But I will tell you what I used to do first. Um, what I would do is I would write down the designer's gauge. And I would write down my gauge. And then let's say the designer's gauge is 25 stitches per inch. And my gauge was 20 sorry, per four inches, <laughs> and my gauge is 20 stitches per four inches. If they told me to cast on 100 stitches, I would take that 100 and divide it by 25, which gets me four in this case. So then I would take that number, four, and multiply it by my gauge, which is 20 stitches per inch, and know that I needed to cast on 80 stitches instead. And obviously the numbers are not normally that round, but I just use the calculator app on my phone so all the decimals don't matter. So that's how I used to do it. And that worked well for me. But the way Jasmine does it, you get to skip a step and so it ends up even faster. Or in her case, all you do is divide your gauge, so 20 stitches per four inches, divided by the designers, which is 25 stitches per four inches, and you're going to get 0.8, right? Yes, okay. And so that number, whatever number it is, is the number, all you have to do is multiply that number by every stitch count or row count or whatever, and that gets you the same thing. So in that case, you would multiply 100 stitches times 0.8, which is 80 stitches. So it just saved you a couple steps. And, um, yeah, clearly she is more on top of her arithmetic than me, so it's nice to have those extra steps saved. So in the case of the Sugar Plum cardigan, my gauge is divided by the gauge from the Phryne jump Phryne cardigan is 0.9, so I'm just multiplying the um, stitches with the arm, that have to do with the armhole and stuff by 0.9 to find out what I need to be doing instead. So hopefully that helped. It was really fun talking to you guys again. I'm sorry I haven't been able to be more regular in my episodes. Honestly, I can't promise that that's going to change in the near future. And I'm not really sure if I'm going to be able to include Knits in the Wild anymore as well because that takes a lot more editing and my body's just not up for it right now. But if I can bring that segment back, I will. And in the meantime, hopefully you enjoyed listening to all the other knitting talk. I think I forgot to mention it, but I'm wearing my Sylvan cowl which I love. I knit it inspired by Claire's wardrobe on the Outlander series, and I wear it all the time. So it's out of 100% baby alpaca. And that is everything. So Thistle and I would like to say goodbye until the next time that we see you. And yeah, if you want to get in touch, feel free to leave comments on YouTube or on Instagram. I'm the charm of it. And on Ravelry. Instagram and YouTube are the the easiest ways for me to reply to comments lately so but I will eventually get to Ravelry things as well but just giving you a heads up so bye